Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man, right? The way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. I like that. If you're a high achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com fill out an application and my team will get back to you with the details hope to see you on the inside done so welcome back to the elliot hulse podcast and today we're going to talk about our collective war on vice let me give some context to where that term even comes from uh it's interesting how god sort of sets me up sometimes for where he wants me to go and so with this show there's a lot of setup but one that some of you might be familiar with is how earlier this year i was smeared slandered i guess you could say by vice media news and so it was in my opinion silly but it was definitely harsh they used my picture in a headline uh on social media that read inciting viol- mass murders against women they use my face as a part of it and so a lot of my friends and uh, fans reached out to me like Elliot look at what they're trying to say about you look what they're doing to you I laughed it off because I thought it was just silly and it had nothing to do with any reality but it sparked something in me which brings us to where we are today with the conversation that we're going to have about the collective war on vice our war on vice my war on vice but all of our Wars on vice. We live in a world that praises vice, that holds vice up to be a virtue. And if you've ever struggled with a vice, and I'm talking specifically to successful men because you know what it takes to succeed in one area of your life, but if you've got a vice that just seems to have its claws dug into you and you just can't get rid of, it has a lot to do with the culture of death that we're living in that allows companies like Vice Media to get a voice. Well, anyway, I just thought it was an interesting, uh, how you say, analogy, or um, it pointed to a greater reality, which is not necessarily a war against the media company itself, but really awoke me to the idea, to the challenge that we're having in our society, particularly with men who are completely subdued in our masculine magnetism and power and ability to create change because we're sucking down suds, playing video games, rubbing our nuts on uh, porn, and essentially being dumbed down and living degenerate lives much smaller than we're called to. So like I opened the show with the call to action to any man who has made great strides in the world, but there's that one thing holding you back. And you know, or maybe you don't know, maybe you need to hear it in this show, because we're gonna talk about what some people do in terms of denial, uh, that if you could just let go, your life would rise. So we're going to talk a little bit about my battle, my personal struggle in war with Vice, not Vice Media, but with a filthy Vice I picked up about the age of 35, (laughs) Uh, as well as what most men don't realize 
about how we got into these uh, this place where vice destroys our life. And what most men do, I'm going to talk about the solution, and I'm going to offer my personal solution, and I'm going to talk to you guys about a program that I think would be really beneficial to some of the men watching this video. So let's begin. Uh, this all really began unfolding uh, not just a few months ago with the Silly Vice Media uh, article, but about seven years ago, when I was at the peak of my business career, I had become a golden boy on YouTube, and many of you guys remember that. Uh, you probably also remember when I went dark. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But if we backtrack to what led up to my success, right? And I, I share this not because I'm bragging today. I share this because I think some of you might be able to put yourself in my shoes where you begin very early, maybe in your 20s. I started a family when I was 23. Uh, and you set yourself on a path and you're focused and determined and you have the, all the vigor and vinegar and piss and pride to get things done. And you work and you strive and you achieve. Now, maybe it's not easy, but you have a purpose, you have a vision, you have a mission. And with your stubbornness, perhaps, your willingness to sacrifice the uh, focus or uh, co consolidation of your will into one area, you start to make some headway and you make your way in the world. Now, if you're a bit younger and you're listening to me right now and you, you can't relate, just understand that if you keep putting one foot in front of the other, you're going to get there. You're going to reach the peak. There's something, there's, something, there's something a little evil about peaking because when you get to the top, if you're not in the right mindset, well, there's nowhere else to go but down. I've been thinking lately how nothing fails like success, especially if you're not prepared for what's coming. And to be completely frank, I was not prepared for the type of attention, the type of uh, fame that I achieved in a very short period of time with YouTube. I had, it wasn't, you no, know, I started YouTube back in 2007 before being a YouTuber or an influencer was even a thing. So it wasn't like, you know, many of the young people watching today will say, well, you know, I've always wanted to be a YouTuber. Well, I never knew what YouTube was. So it kind of creeped up on me. It snuck up on me. I didn't realize it was what would happen. And so I was unprepared emotionally, mentally. And there are some things that I wish I would have known, but I'm happy that I found out later. And so my story goes, I started smoking weed. I got to uh, the peak of my business career. And uh, I, I, I have to say that in some way, my ego must have gotten the best of me. And I thought that I could, I thought I deserved something. Uh, I know I speak to many of the guys that are in my programs now and they talk to me about how they'll come home at night uh, after a long, hard day of work and, you know, suck down some vodka because they feel like they deserved it, right? Or, you you know, you worked all week long and Friday night comes and you go to the bar and you get hammered, right? Like, because you deserved it. And I sort of had that same mindset as well, meaning I put in many, many, many years, uh, raising my family as well as building my business, and I was as clean as you can get. But one day I decided that I think I, need, I deserve something. <laughs> I tell you right now, you don't deserve anything. I didn't deserve anything, but I thought I did, and it's a slippery slope, and, uh, and it usually comes in the form of seeking some created good, some pleasure. And I wasn't really much of a drinker, and uh, I had always maintained pretty good shape, so I didn't binge on food. But I decided that I was going to start smoking ganja. And it was amazing. It was great. It was the break I was looking for. And it woke something beautiful up inside me, or so I thought, right? Like, because with every high, there's a low. This must have been about 2003. 13. And it started off as a once in a while, once a week thing to 
when I got to the point where I went dark on YouTube, maybe around 2015, that I was smoking every day. I was basically throwing away everything I've worked so hard for up until that point. I left the gym, practically gave it away. I stopped making YouTube videos. Uh, I stopped working out. I was smoking weed and doing yoga. That's what I, I wanted to be a hippie for a while. I thought I deserved it. I've been so hardcore my whole life, right? College football, strong man. I'm going to smoke some weed and stretch. <laughs> that was my mindset. And it got real bad. My business, I, because I created so much momentum, I created enough momentum, let me put it that way. I could have done so much more. Uh, but because I created so much uh, momentum, enough momentum, I was able to ride on it for a while. And then things started getting tough, uh, mainly in my home. And it wasn't that I was a bad father or uh, a bad husband, and my wife never really complained, but she knew that I could be better. She knew that I could do better, and sh sh she would never say it, but I knew that she was sort of disappointed in me in that I was smoking weed every day. And I, I, di I didn't take heed because I was like, well, I'm going to do whatever I want because whatever I did got us to where we are. So I must be right. Think about that. Pride. <laughs> pride, brothers. I tell you. Sneaks up. It's very insidious. Uh, the one that I at least have to always be vigilant against. But anyway, so... The story goes like this. There was a time when my father-in-law, my wife's mother, or my I'm sorry, my wife's father uh, came to stay with us because he was very sick. And during that time, I was still getting high. Uh, he was here for a few days and I had a dream. And in that dream, I heard... Elliot, you are going, you and Guy, that's her, his, her father's name, you and Guy are going to make Colleen very miserable. Well, the next day, may he rest in peace, her father passed. He died that night. And that, what, that meant it was just left to me now to be who either was going to be the man that's going to lead my wife and be the father that I was called to be or I was going to make her miserable just like the state that she found herself in after her father died. Well, I knew something had to be changed. I knew something had to change. I knew I needed to change. Luckily, there were a few things that I had explored around that time, one of which was masculine initiation. Uh, when I really discovered that I didn't have the strength to overcome my attachment. Some people say marijuana is not addicting, but I'm not so sure, but maybe it was an attachment. When I couldn't overcome my attachment, I started seeking and I saw it in many different areas. Uh, we're going to talk about a few of those areas now, but one of which was the discovery of this pattern of masculine initiation that happens for a man whether he knows it, likes it or not, or whether or not the world recognizes or facilitates it. You could say that I was sort of in an early midlife crisis. Now, that's the term that they use in our culture because they don't understand the prize that's on the other side of a quote unquote crisis. But essentially I was going through a phase of death and rebirth. And this is not something that just happens once or twice. It happens multiple times in a man's life. It may happen on a predictable pattern, like a clock, certain age, but it also could be kicked into gear early or in the middle of a phase. It could happen at any time. And for me, it was both chronological, it was the right time, it was a time in my life, but it was also kicked off by my pride. And I listened to a, uh, I listened to a, a, I think it was a monk or, or a guy in a monastery on YouTube today. And he says that anytime there's a 
he says something to the effect of anytime there's, there's a vice or there's a hang up or there's an addiction that you can't get rid of, just know that Christ allows that into your life. And it may be because he knows that there is a worse vice hiding behind the obvious vice that needs to be recognized. And he said that usually it's pride. And so if you can't get rid of an addiction, a big, a big part of the reason why is because of pride. But either way, God allows that in your life so that you can you can uproot that, so you can uproot that pride or that other deeper sin within your character, the position of your heart. You know, sometimes it's not so much what we're, we're doing with our hands and our, and our flesh, uh, it's what's behind that, what's the position of our heart. And so he was trying to expose, I believe, trying to expose this position of my heart, this wrong set position of my heart. Even, even, the, say, even the sense of saying, I deserve something, right? Those of you who I think m many of you, most of you, probably familiar with that sense, especially when it comes towards abuse uh, or, or substance use. I deserve this. That's how it starts. Well, anyway, so I don't know where I was going with that, but in masculine initiation, I started to recognize that it was a uh, it was being called into my life. That's right. I think God allowed me to fall down that rabbit hole of vice to bring up this new this crisis, so that there would be this death and rebirth in my personal life. And I want you guys to put yourself in my shoes also too. Uh, if you're struggling right now, the reason why I tell my story is not so that you know more about me, but so that you may be able to reflect on you, where you are in your life, and how you may be struggling with the sin of pride or any other uh, anger, perhaps, right? It, all, it seems like pride is the foundation for almost all of them, because if you're anger, usually there's a lot of uh, justification for your anger. But anyway, the deeper sin, the deeper effeminate, weak, dark, heavy, emasculated character that's screaming to be recognized and to be rectified and dealt with, right? And so if you're dealing with something, if you're dealing with a vice, you're drinking too much, smoking too much, overeating. This, we live in a world that's so funny that like if you're an alcoholic and you're trying to quit drinking, they will tell you, don't have another sip of, of, of liquor or whiskey or whatever, right? Don't drink it because it's a slippery slope. But yet we almost overlook eating addiction as a legitimate thing. If you're fat, you know what they tell you? Eat less. You don't tell an alcoholic drink less. You don't tell him, oh, just have drinks on Friday. Why do we tell obese people that it's okay to keep eating? You got to fast, bro. We're going to get into that in a moment. But anyway, so... Whatever it is, you know what? You know what's a big one, fellas, and it's mostly with the younger dudes. Filthy viewing, watching porn, PMO, rubbing your genie, watching those bad videos on the screen. That's that may seem like it's an outward sort of sin but it destroys your physiology. And many of you guys know this now. You're the first generation that has seen how bad porn is because you got it unlimited. It destroys your brain. You know it destroys your brain, it destroys your hormones. Drinking, drugs, overeating, overworking, that's another one, right? We got a sense of pride for putting, our, putting it in there, putting in our time, right? Uh, I, I was definitely doing that. Uh, and then porn. Even, even promiscuity, chasing women, all these things numb us or hide us from what's underneath and what needs to be dealt with. It also can be used as a catalyst for what needs to be dealt with. So anyway, I'm trying to bring this uh, to you so that you know I'm not just talking about me, right? We're all fallen in some way. And so here's me being objective and vulnerable with you about me and weed. And so I was, I was lucky enough to discover the 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 archetype of initiation. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, but first, let's talk about what most men do. 
you might find yourself in a number of different places, right? Like, so if you're familiar with what I'm talking about, you might shrug it off and excuse your sin. You might shrug it off and say, hey, it's no big deal. What's a big deal, right? Or you can't even see it as a problem. The biggest problem is when you don't see it's a problem because then it can eat away at you from the underworld. It can work on you from the shadows. That's why a religion like Christianity requires that you recognize and repent for your sins. Because if you're okay and I'm okay, then there's no need for change. So if I'm talking to you right now and you are still convinced that you got control over something that you have been binging on for the past few years, well then I, I, I invite you to listen. Because maybe you don't have as much control as you think you do. At least I didn't because I'm a willful guy. I'm a strong man. What does a strong man do? A strong man can lift anything, can break anything, can do anything. But I couldn't. Maybe you're stronger than me. If you are, then put it down. So a lot of guys will not see it as a problem. Pretend it's not a problem. Or excuse the sin. So Father Ripperger says... Sin interlocks, uh, sin darkens the intellect. What that means is you start justifying your sins. You start justifying your vice. It darkens the intellect, meaning now you have to do mental gymnastics in order to keep doing the thing that some, somewhere deep down inside you, you know is not right. So if that kind of guy, listen closely. We also have those who procrastinate, guys who drag their feet. Guys who keep saying, okay, next week, okay, next month, okay, next year, okay, eventually, oh, after I get this, I'll do it. After I achieve that, I'll do it. And you just keep kicking the can down the road. I listened to a book, a, a small little audio book. I forget the name of it. It's something like How, how Satan sneaks up, so, sneaks up on You, like the, the Sneaky Tricks of Satan, something like that. <laughs> And it's a, it's a cute little story, right? I say cute, but it's like about, it's about all the demons in hell having a conversation with the top dog. And the top, the top demon, right? Let's call him Satan. Uh, he's trying to figure out which one of his demons are the worst. Like, like in other words, like the most powerful. And, he go, and the whole story, he goes through a bunch of them. The one that he finally crowns the best demon is the one who is very subtle. And he says, I don't make anybody do anything. All I do is tell them they can wait till tomorrow. That's all he did. And he was, he, was a, he was the strongest demon in hell in this little story. He, so they had demons that were like, that would like convince people to do things that were all really like ba overtly bad. The worst demon in hell is the one that says, wait till tomorrow. You can do it tomorrow. Right. And then you kick that can, you kick that can, you kick that can till tomorrow was well, six years ago. <laughs> and your life sucks and you don't know why. Procrastinators. And then we also have those who maybe, maybe more of you guys can relate to it, and it's a very frustrating place to be, but are those that try and fail. I tried that and it didn't work. I trusted this and it failed. I went here, I did this, I gave this up for a time, but damn, it came back. It seems like no matter how much willpower you use, how much resolve you make, how many resolutions you take, that damn thing just keeps coming back. And it's almost like you don't have it. It's almost like there's a, a second mind inside you that takes over. At least I know this was the case for me. I'd speak out of two sides of my mouth. One side of my mouth is like, I want to, I'm going to be virtuous. I'm going to be clean. I'm going to be righteous. I'm going to, I want to be holy. I want to be the strongest version of myself. I know I must, I have to, because if I'm going to be a leader of men, which I've been called to, whether I like it or not, I can't lead them off the cliff. I got to get right. And the other side, it says, what's the big deal? You can have a little bit more. You deserve it. Remember that one? <laughs> right? What's one more shot? What's one more chance? What's doing it a little bit? It's legal. Everybody else is doing it. It's not that bad, right? And so it was literally like those two, like an angel and a demon on the shoulders like they showed in the cartoon when he was a kid, right? 
Literally. So that's where you're in this conflict, inner conflict, conflicted with self. Man, what a terrible place to be. How do we get there that we have not the strength to overcome and not the vision or the purpose or mission that's worth reaching for? Because like I said before, I was successful. And if you're watching this now and you've mastered money and you're making it in the world, but you're struggling with vice and you know it will destroy your life, then you know that success, nothing fails like success. Nothing fulfills like our Lord. But that's what we'll get to in a moment. Wealth, pleasure, power. Wealth, pleasure, power, and honor. Those are the four false gods. You know, they say there's a whole lot of misconception with regard to religion, right? And so there are those who believe that they don't believe in God. They say they don't believe in God. But if you're chasing wealth, if you're chasing pleasure, if you're chasing power, if you're chasing honor, those are, that's your God. That becomes your God. The problem with those gods is that they're all false gods. Those are the false idols. Those are the four false idols of mankind. Every other false idol is some way of a permutation of that. Self-worship, right? Pride, it all falls right into that. So you can chase wealth, you can gain wealth, but at some point you're going to feel demystified by it. You're going to realize, damn, this wasn't it. Honor. Nobody had more honor than me. I was a golden boy on YouTube when YouTube first came out. Millions of people know me, saw me, venerate me. I speak to young men. I meet them quite often these days. And, oh, Elliot, you changed my life. But that doesn't change my heart. Doesn't set the posture of my heart towards righteousness. And so I fell. Pleasure, that's what the whole weed smoking was about. Power, right? Wealth is power. I had a, there was a moment when I almost caught myself in a power trip. I, looked, I, I remember watching Scarface, the movie Scarface. I was like, damn, I'm starting to act like that guy. Tony Montana, right? Power tripping, power tripping. Think about that guy too. He came from nothing. Watch the movie Scarface. It's fun to watch. But that guy was tragic. What a tragic story. He was a criminal anyway, ruthless. But you see how power corrupts. So there I am. There I was. That's where you might be right now. And what do you do? So let's talk about how we got into this place with regard to our society and the, the state of masculinity today. I'm talking specifically towards men. And I'm talking very practically now in a moment because uh, I don't want to get too high up in the clouds. I want to talk about what's practical, what's biological, what's anthropological, what is rooted in our DNA. And then we'll ascend and we'll talk spirit. But if we don't confront what's in front of us, which is the darkness of sin, which is just embedded in our DNA. You know, they say that we are in a fallen state. If you think scientifically, really, we're super based. Like, in terms of material, we've fallen into the third dimension, right? We're living in a fallen state. And in that fallen state, there are rules like gravity, right? There's, there's rules like you eat and then you poop. There's laws that's associated with this third dimension, this fallen state that we find ourselves in. There's beauty, God's imprint on it, but there are laws and the things that need to be done, whether you believe or not, right? Whether you believe in God or not, you still got to eat, right? Whether you believe in gravity or not, if you jump out of a building, you're going to fall, right? And so one of the things that's evident in our world, is, it's beautiful because we live in a, in a world that we can interpret, right? That's why we have science. 
we can recognize patterns, right? Cyclical patterns. And so initiation is something that is a pattern that, well, anthropologists study and recognize is evident in all societies, has been evident, is happening either in a resourceful way or an unresourceful way in every society, even our own. And the pattern looks like this. The traditional, the pattern of traditional masculinity, I've talked about, I've talked about this in the show many times before. But in a word, it's a movement away from the world of the mother, atonement with the world of the father. A movement away from a feminacy, a movement away from pleasure, a movement away from vice, a movement away from matter, the matrix, all things sensually gratifying that we become very attached to because that's what we come from, our mother. And we believe, we start to believe that it's who we are. Even when you're a baby, they say that there's a love object relation where the baby thinks that it is its mother. But then there's a love object relation loss when the baby realizes, oh, my mother's that and this is me. That's how, that's how deeply ingrained we are with the material world. And for us as human beings coming from our mother. For that boy to become a man, there must be a clean break from the mother because he's of a different order of being and called to a different place in life. I've already ranted a bunch on different shows about how the loss of that break, we don't have breaks from, from the world of the mother. It's not, you know, it is the physical mother, but it's the world of the mother. Anytime you drinking and getting high, anytime you playing video games or rubbing your nut off, you're attached to the world of the mother. Every time you chase in, think about even money, mammon, mammy, mammon, money, mummy. Mammon is money, right? In the Bible, right? It's like the, the, the God of wealth. Think about mammon and mammary glands. Mammary glands, mommy. It's like you're just trying to suckle from material existence. Wealth, power, pleasure, honor. All seeking created goods, material goods. Mommy seeking. Most of the relationships that men get in today are merely replacements for their mommies. Because there's been no clean break from the mommy. But not only that, fellas, so that might sound great. So what do you do, Elliot? You create some austerity. You create that break. This is what our ancestors would do. They would take a boy and they would take him up to the mountain. And they would break him down. Literally break him down. Fast him for days. And not like our, you know, intermittent fasting with mineral juice. Ha! No. They'll dry fast him out in the sun for days. Turn him into a raisin. And then start exacting punishment, challenges. Because you got to break that baby boy ego. How many of you have never had any real challenge in your life? Only perceived challenges. Oh, somebody hurt my feelings. And I'm not making fun of you. We just don't live in a world that subjects men to that kind of challenge, those kinds of hardships, that kind of suffering. You must die. I've said this in one of my videos, a very popular video of mine, where I talk about suicide rate with men. Suicide is real. The sense that you want to die is real. The only problem is it's not that your physical body needs to die, your ego needs to die. Who you think you are, your attached self, your baby boy mama milk seeking self, sucking on a bottle and chasing puss, that guy needs to die. But you get to rise. So there's that. There's no movement away from the mother. And, and, and mind you, there's a, there's a lot that needs to be done there. And there's a lot of people doing great work in that realm today. I feel like today in particular, man, the world is moving so fast. And you see how there are men in the social sphere, social media, videos and whatnot, like Jocko, right? Who are, who are making men feel proud about being disciplined. That's good. That's, a, that's teaching men a clean break from the mother. Jordan Peterson does this to a degree, right? To a degree. And there are other men like me 
that many of y'all know who show you, you got to subject yourself to the pain of the barbell. Get into the gym, work hard, right? David Goggins, right, is another one, right? Go run till your face falls off. That's punishment. That's austerity. That's challenge. That's cleaning the, that's having a clean break from the mother. But that's only half the battle, brothers. We live in a world with loss of meaning, complete loss of meaning. That loss of meaning can be encapsulated in the loss of father. We live in a matriarchy, make no mistake about it. That's why all this vice, that's why all this addiction, that's why all this attachment. What, what sentiment is sparked in your soul when you hear the word father even? Because there's a zeitgeist around father right now and it ain't so good. You bring up father in most black communities and they get mad at you. My dad left when I was 10, hadn't seen him since. If you wanna know what's being unfolded on the rest of the society, look at what happens to the black community because that's where all the experiments happen, right? Because now it's not just them, it's everybody. Everybody has a hatred for father in a number of different ways. 90% of men have poor relation to their father. And that's significant. Both the father physically, literally, and metaphorically. Just like I use metaphor for material, for mother, med mother, material, matter. Father, father's metaphor is Physical father, just like physical mother, but God the father. The word matter, mother comes from matter. The word father comes from pattern. We are literally the pattern in the matter. You're your father's pattern in your mother's matter, right? Your mother gives you the matter, your father gives you the pattern. We have over addiction and attachment to matter and hatred for pattern. Antonio Gramsci, the founder, or one of the founders of cultural Marxism, which is the, is the subverting force of our day, ultimately it's communism, understood and voiced that in order to destroy the Western civilization, right, because they were able to destroy the, West, the East, right, Russia and whatnot, with bombs and bullets and revolution, but in order to really get to the West after the world wars, they had it to, he said it in this way, they have to remove the father. And what that literally meant was you got to make the society atheistic and you got to break up the family. Where are we today? Men, I tell you that if you sever from the mother, but you have no atonement with the father, you'll still be a lost boy, only worse. Exploring the world of the father that gives you meaning, that gives you purpose, it gives you vision, it gives you mission, it gives you dignity. It's about generativity, which the word generations come from. It's about legacy. It's about transcendence. All these things to say that it's about spirit. Because when the ancestors took the boy out of his home and took him up to the mountain and whooped his butt and broke him down, they only did it because they needed to do one thing with that clean slate. They clean the slate, clean the slate, break the ego. Right? Which is good. I know a lot of you guys crave that. We're going to keep, we're going to talk more about that in a moment, but I got to give you the big picture. That's when religion was introduced myth story was introduced we don't have a collective story we don't have a collective myth or except for whatever disney gives us mind you it's all based on commercial right it's all uh fascist right we literally are uh, war, we worship media, right? Screens and uh, pop culture, right? This is this is this is the Lord of our day, right? 
And so we lack, even, even if there is an atonement, it's with, it's with a false father. It's a false faith. It's those four things I talked about before, right? Wealth, power, pleasure, and honor. Think about, I don't like to use his name too much because I don't want to give him props, but think about Andrew Tate. Is he taking you to the father? Or is he taking you to wealth, power, pleasure, and honor? What happened prior to the destruction of Christendom in the West, which was the point of cultural Marxism? Men oriented themselves, oriented their lives towards vocation. And the primary vocation for most men was family. That or being generative in some way. It could be not just family, but family is, the, is, is, is generative in its, just in its nature because you're creating generations, new generations. But not every man's called to that. Not every man was called to that. Another vocation was to be a man that was a ritual elder or spiritual leader, i.e. the clergy. Or a man would be called to service in some way, maybe military service, maybe as a helper in some way to somebody with some grand vision that he got behind, a builder of sorts. But it was, it was, he didn't have all this confusion that we have in our day right now where men don't know what our path is. That's the number one question I get from most men today. I don't know what to do, Elliot. I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what my place is. I don't know what my mission is in this world. Could you imagine that only 150, 200 years ago, that was never really an issue? Most men were oriented towards vocation. Where you get the, where the word comes from voice, to be called. Right, and your calling was usually very evident. I was telling the guys on my on one of my lesson calls today that I had an intern at Strength Camp, a young man who, who was a uh, very good man, didn't know where he wanted to be in life. So part of him coming to the Strength Camp and uh, and being an intern was because he was kind of like exploring, trying to figure out what he wanted to be in life. He told me that he was from seven generations of bakers in France. Seven generations. Think about that. That's like 700 years. For 700 years, his father, his grandfather, his great grandfather, his great great grandfather, great 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 grandfather, great 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 grandfather, great 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 grandfather had the same vocation, the same mission, the same vision. The whole town grew up around that bakery. All the neighbors and all the family and all the generations were there. I'm sure not one of those men through all those generations ever had to ask themselves, what is my purpose in life? He got older because he was learning and he was learning how to bake the bread. He made he made the bread, he made a family, and he went to church on Sunday. That was his life. That was a grand life. That's a great life. That's an awesome life of dedication and, and hard work and focus and single mindedness on vocation. Today, it's crazy. You know what the craziest thing that happened to us? Is the idea that we could be anything. You could do whatever you want. That creates chaos. And that's why so many men are lost. When you tell people you could do whatever you want, you know what they do? They start looking at other people and what they're doing because we, as men, we need an example. So we start looking at other people and we say, well, I guess that's what I'm supposed to do with absolutely no discernment for your own vocation or path in life or your own inclinations as a man because you don't even know your father and your father may have the seed. He is your seed. He's your essence. They call him your, your seed, your essence. There's something about who you're supposed to be and what your inclinations are and what your gifts are if you know your father. I know that's hard to hear and I'm going to get kicked back because most of y'all hate your father. And I'm not saying that I'm not saying that it's not justified because he didn't receive initiation and his father didn't receive re initiation. Maybe before that. His father received initiation. So we're, we're, we're at least three generations into lost boys. 
being led by other lost boys. So let's, let's, let's back up here for a moment, right? You're a successful man who's chased wealth, power, pleasure, and honor and has achieved that, but yet there's an emptiness inside. There's a hole inside. There's something that's not fulfilled, and so what? You get drunk. You get high. You waste your life. I implore you that if you just break this away by itself and don't fill it with pattern, with meaning, with transcendent meaning, not just corporate works of mercy, but divine works of mercy, prayer, and ascension, dedication, and devotion to the Lord, you're going to fall short. You're going to fall short again and again and again. And, and something else is going to take its place. No worldly created thing can fill the place of the creator. No created thing can fulfill the place of the creator. And our ancestors understood that. We're living in a time where the, the atheism is a brain cramp. Because how, how arrogant could we possibly be to think that from all time and place on earth, people worshipped some God, but you so smart that you don't need one. That's why we're killing ourselves. But I'm not going to go into what I know to be God, God of the Bible, and the amazing relationship that I have with my father, God the Father, through atonement with my earthly father. Because the world has made us believe that that's very subjective. Anything's okay. Anything goes. Well, you see where we are right now. When a society doesn't have a collective value, when we don't have collective virtue, when we don't have a collective story that transcends wealth, power, pleasure, and honor, we find ourselves in a place that we are right now. And so many people feel lonely. That's a part of the reason why we end up plugging it up with dark vice. So what do we do? Where do we go? Who do we seek out? Who do we collaborate with? Where is the answer? Many people will give you di many different ideas about what the answer is, and there's an element of truth to many of them. Some people believe that if you just believe and you say, Jesus Christ is my Lord, all that will be fixed. Maybe that's true. But we also live in this world. There's some people who believe that if you just say, or if you just achieve, or you just receive more goods in this world, you'll be okay. Maybe that's true. But I say there's a combination of the two. Part of the reason why I like Catholicism so much is because it's a, it's a physical faith. Like we eat our Lord, we have rites of initiation, rites of passage. Uh, it's under attack. There's no, mean, there's no question about it. But a lot of the elements, a lot of the physical elements and the spiritual elements come together, like in the Holy Eucharist. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole yet, though. Let's back up, bro. So, the war on vice. is about initiation. It's about breaking away from vice and it's about atoning with the Father. It's about moving from vice to virtue. Vice to virtue. And in this pattern of traditional masculine initiation, there are four parts. There are four elements, four pillars that have to be present. Sacred space, ritual elder, communitas, and ritual process. I want to talk to you for a moment about a project that I put forth and I've been working with hundreds of men at this point and carrying them through this process 
of masculine initiation using these pillars. And if what I'm describing sounds like something that you might benefit from, I invite you to go to my website, waronvice.com. I'm not looking for every man, but I'm looking for a man that understands that what I'm saying is true. A man who has already perhaps experienced a sort of breakthrough. I've achieved somewhat somehow in my life, but still something subsides. Still, I get caught up in vice. And if you understand that this process of breaking away from vice, but then building virtue, atoning with the Father, ascending as a man, might be for you, then listen closely. Sacred space is about a pattern interrupt and creating boundaries around yourself for growth. In order for a man to grow, it's almost like it needs to be in, the, in a hot container like an oven. What happens when you open the oven after you turn it on? The heat escapes. There needs to be consolidation of our mind and our energy and our focus. That's so hard to do in this day when there's so many damn distractions. That's why our ancestors would pluck the boy up out of society and take him up to the mountain. But can we do that? Probably not. In a way we can, and that's coming too. I'm gonna do, we're gonna have some live events. But for the most part, it's up to you. And so what I've created is a private app. Most of you guys don't know this. This is something that has been unfolding for the past six months or so, almost a year. And so this is our sacred space. You create sacred space in your home, and I'm going to show you how. But we also create sacred space for what? For eldership and for communitas. I'll tell you about that, those next two in a moment. So sacred space. Sacred space, as I'm doing my best to try to bring forth and recreate masculine initiation in our digital age, which, trust me, I understand it's pseudo-initiation. It's not, it's not the peak of what we really need. But I'm, I'm trying my best here, and I want to reach as many men as possible. So if you scoff at the idea of a sacred space being within inside an app, then you tell me how you're going to do better. Like I said, we'll do some live events, but we need to get this process going right now, especially if your life is on the line. So there's no distractions inside my app. It's not a Facebook group or a Telegram group where you're getting pings and notifications from other silly things. But what's the big deal? An app is an app. What's happening inside is what's important. Next step is ritual eldership. I've been called to this place. I've been put through the ringer so that I could stand in this place and so that I could stand in for you. I got a lot of work to do. I'm still on my way. But there's a lot that I've experienced, there's a lot that I know, there's a lot that I've learned, and there's a lot of men that I've saved. I'm not a savior, but I can point to the savior. I can point to the way. I can lead by example, and that's what I've done to this day. And I don't even know how I got here, but by the grace of God. I'm with you every step of the way through the initiation process that's happening inside our ritual process. I'm there with the men. Uh, Multiple times a week. We have multiple Zoom meetings a week. We have awards assembly monthly. You have direct access to me through the app. And I carry you through a process. We're going to get to that in a moment. And so you're getting lessons every single day. You're getting accountability from step three, a community. Community is really, well, communitas is really what community is, but with an elevated sense. Because when you're working towards a common goal or struggling in the same way as other men, there's a bond that is born. And so a part of the community aspect is that we have regular get togethers, regular meetups, regular online meetups and physical meetups. We're having something happening here in February coming up pretty soon. If you want to join us, you can, I'd love to have you protect with Elliot.com use Hulse 10 as a, as a code. So I know that you're with my crew, H U L S E 10 protect with Elliot. And you're going to meet many of the men in my program. Men who are battling in the war on vice. Communitas takes place when you know that if you fall back, you fall down, you don't fulfill, 
that another bro has your back. He's gonna call you out when you slip. If you need a shoulder to lean on, or somebody to speak to, somebody who knows because they've been through that just like you, they're there for you. I also have an assistant and I have experts, assistant experts to help you grow in virtue. I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. Ritual process. Here's the ritual process. It's 90 days broken up into three phases. Phase one is initiation. It's pure austerity and challenge and pain. And you're going to suffer. Because if you don't suffer, you don't grow. I'll be straight up with you right now. There's a lot of fasting involved for 21 days. A lot of fasting, a lot of dopamine detoxing. A lot of breaking away from things that you never thought that you could. And you don't have to use willpower because you got me and you got your community and you have your set away space to help you do it. There are a lot of challenging exercises. I won't get into all of them. But a lot of things that you're called to do on a daily basis for what? To break down the baby boy ego, to free yourself from the attachment to vice. This is our war on vice phase one. Phase two is transformation. And this is where we begin to work on elevating that atonement with God, the Father, the spiritual combat, gearing up for the long battle, for final perseverance, for phase three, which is for life. Stage two includes working on building yourself up in all the areas that are most important for you and your vocation as a man. We have a campus on family. We got a campus on faith. We got a campus on fitness. And we got a campus on business, work, career. And so as you break away from vice, you get to be built up in these areas virtuously so that you can continue on in life and not only be a generative man for the people around you, but for generations to come. And so when you join my program, you're in for life. That's my gift to you. You don't just join and 30 days you get something, 90 days you get something. No, you're joining my militia for life. I call it the monastic militia because we're living disciplined lives in this degenerate world. There's a monastic movement happening on the planet right now, but most men only have it halfway. It's not just about the disciplines of breaking free from addiction and effeminacy. It's about atonement with the Father. Atonement with your Father and God the Father. Meaning and purpose and pattern and mission and vision and generativity for life. So that sounds like something that might benefit you. If my story about rising and falling and the failure of success and not being able to break free, but knowing that there's more for you, there's more for me, and you want to explore, go to waronvice.com. Fill out the application, and maybe I'll speak to you one-on-one, mano y mano, old Uncle E and you to see if we're a good fit. And so I hope you guys enjoyed this show today. I hope you receive some benefit from our conversation. I also hope to see you face-to-face -face on a call when you fill out that form on War on Vice because my work is not complete without you. And we're in this together. We're doing it. We're growing. Why? For generativity and the generations to come. You got to be strong for you, but also for your sons. That's it, that's all, I'm done. If you're a high achieving businessman, executive or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self-sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I've personally confronted and overcome the same struggles 
when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com, fill out an application, and my team will get back to you with the details. Hope to see you on the inside. Done.